Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 2.1 in our videos about relational databases. In this video, we're going to be giving a brief overview of what relational databases are. We're going to talk about how we represent a relational schema using an entity relationship diagram. We'll talk about structural constraints, such as different types of keys, relationships, and joins, and then move into a brief discussion on structured query language, where we'll talk about data definition language, data query language, and data manipulation language. And then finally, we'll close the video with a discussion of how relational databases are transactional in nature and must maintain ACID compliance, or that is that the transactions are atomic, consistent, isolated and durable. So let's get started. So relational databases came about in the 1970s after Edgar Codd, who was working for IBM at the time, published this revolutionary paper called A Relational Model of Data for Large Shared Data Banks. And the driving force behind this was that uh, as Codd saw data becoming more and more important, he was a little bit worried that most of the current data management strategies were just kind of willy-nilly and they weren't really uh, based in any kind of scientific foundation. So Cod, being a mathematician, came up with this mathematical representation of how we could manage data called the relational uh, system. And so this is based on set theory and uses relational algebra to describe how data can interact with one another. So at a high level overview, a relation, which we sometimes think of as a table, is just a set of unique unordered tuples or rows. A tuple is a set of unordered attributes and attributes have to have a data type. And these attributes are usually what we think of as columns. So it's just this two dimensional structure of rows and columns. And then within the relational database, there are a number of constraints to enforce consistency within the database, right? So constraints about certain uh, attributes have to have unique values. And uh, when we have a foreign key that refers to some candidate key, all values of our candidate key must be, or of our foreign key must be in the domain of values of the candidate key. Just things like that to keep the database working properly. And then there are a number of operations that we can execute on the relations. We can select certain tuples, we can project certain attributes, or we can join tables together or perform some set theory operation on our relations, such as union, intersection, or difference, right? And all of these constraints and all of the attributes are described in the schema of our relation. And so we can visually represent our schema using an entity relationship diagram, which uses this special language called ER modeling grammar to represent our understanding of the business rules. And so one of the, or the two great things that our ER diagram does is it gives us a more user-friendly way of describing our understanding of the business rules back to the business people but then it also is precise and technical enough that we can take this ER diagram and write SQL DDL code to actually create the database uh, as we're going to use it, right? So it's a visual representation of our schema. And this is one of the important things about relational databases is they are based on this principle of design first. Okay, we design our schema and put all our constraints in place before we ever start putting data into the database um, or ever start using it, which is a little bit different, oddly, than how some non-relational databases work, where you can start putting data into the database without really having designed or laid out what the schema is going to look like or how your data is going to look. And so the benefit this design-first approach gives us is what we call query pliancy, which means we can really ask any question of our database. In a relational database, we need to know what the data is going to look like, but not what questions we're going to be asking. Non-relational databases, for the most part, kind of work in the other direction, where we may not know what our data is going to look like ahead of time, but we do know exactly what questions we are going to be asking the database. So that's a little bit of a trade-off between relational and non-relational databases. So to give an example of how our ER diagrams work, we have a short vignette here that we're going to read. Bizan Grocers is a grocery store where customers can buy a wide range of products. 
The first time a customer completes a purchase at BG, they are assigned a customer ID and their first name and last name are recorded in the database. All items at BG are identified by a UPC and have a description, quantity on hand, and price. Customers typically purchase several products on each visit to BG and may purchase several units of the same item. The approach that I like to take is to identify all of our entities and then the relationships between those entities. And typically we think of entities as the things that are the nouns in our story. So the person, place, and things and uh, relationships to be the verbs in the story. So as I'm reading through this, uh, it's a grocery store where customers can buy a wide range of products. And I think those are gonna be the only two entities in this story. And the relationship between these entities is that customers buy products. So we represent our entities with squares. So we have customer and product, and then we have this diamond or this relationship between the entities. A customer buys a product, or we could say a product is bought by a customer. So we have some attributes of customers, their customer ID, their first name, and their last name. And you can see here we've underlined the customer ID to identify that this is our unique identifier for the customer. It's going to be our primary key. Okay. We also have some attributes about a product, the universal product code or UPC description, quantity on hand, and price. And we've uh, chosen UPC here as our unique identifier. We have some additional structural constraints around the participation and cardinality of these entities in our relationship. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is our participation. And in the story, it says the first time a customer completes a purchase at BG, they are assigned a customer ID. So it sounds like we probably couldn't have any customers or no one would be considered a customer before they've completed a purchase. So I'm going to say customer has mandatory participation in this relationship, which we're going to represent by this little line here across the relationship. So a customer buys a minimum of one product. And knowing what I know about grocery stores, I'm gonna say that there is the chance that a product might not ever be purchased, right? And like the, as soon as we, like when we first get a new product, in the house, uh, maybe no one has bought it yet. So we're going to say product has optional participation in this relationship, okay? Uh, reading a little more into the story, uh, customers typically purchase several products on each visit to uh, Bizan Grocers. So the cardinality of customer is going to be many, which we're going to represent by either an M or an N here, just on the other side of the relationship and uh, may purchase several units of the same item. Okay, so that's saying that when we have an individual product, a customer might purchase it multiple times, multiple units of that, which also implies that we could have multiple customers purchase the same item. Uh, so product is also going to have a cardinality of many. Okay, now another thing that would kind of tip us off here that product has a cardinality of many is that we have this attribute called quantity on hand. So kind of the way I'm looking at this is that we have one class of product, like a, a bag of Doritos, and we're gonna say we have 20 of these individual bags of Doritos in our inventory. So Doritos can be purchased multiple times. Now this is different than if we were tracking each individual product, which would be uh, the case if we were looking at something like automobiles that are uniquely identified by their VIN. Right? Cell phones have a unique identifier for each individual cell phone. Firearms all have a serial number, so you track those individually, but something like a box of cereal or a bag of potato chips, you don't track those individually, you just track them uh, as a class of product, and then we have this quantity on hand. And then looking in just a little bit more depth into this very last statement here, uh, customers may purchase several units of the same item. So it sounds like there might be a quantity of a product that a customer would purchase. Now, is that an attribute of the customer or of the product? Well, neither. That's actually going to be an attribute of our relationship because the quantity of the product being purchased is going to depend on the combination of the customer and the product. Okay, so that's a, an attribute of our relationship. Now, some of you may know that we actually can't 
create a many-to-many -many relationship in a database. What we have to do is decompose this into two one-to-many relationships and have this special type of relation in the middle called a gerund. Okay, so each instance of this gerund is going to represent a product that a customer has purchased and there will be some quantity of that product. So this, uh, this basically is capturing each line on the receipt when a customer purchases a product, okay? So when we create this gerund, the primary key of the two uh, relations that were in the many-to-many -many relationship that the gerund is decomposing both go into the gerund and are foreign keys which reference that primary key in the original relation. Okay, so customer ID and UPC are both foreign keys and together make up a composite primary key. Now, some of you may have already noticed the problem that we are going to encounter here, which is that in this current design, a customer could only purchase a product one time, right? So what we actually want to do is probably uh, record something like the date of the purchase so that on multiple days, the customer could come back and purchase the same uh, product or a product with the same UPC. And I have to admit, this is really a lot simplified from how we would actually design this database because in reality, instead of capturing the date of purchase as part of the gerund, we would probably have another relation that's like a, a shopping cart or something like that where you record individual transactions. But for the sake of what we're going to be doing in this demo, let's just uh, kind of leave it at this for the time being. Now, before we go any further, we need to talk a little bit about keys. Three types of keys that we often talk about that refer to the uniqueness of tuples within our relation are the super keys, candidate keys, and primary key of the relation. So a super key just has the property of being unique, and we might have lots of those in our relation. A candidate key is just a super key that is irreducible, that we can't make any more simple and it remain unique. And then a primary key is just a candidate key that we have selected uh, to apply the entity integrity constraint to, which means that it cannot be null. So the primary key is what we most often think of as a unique identifier within our relation, but candidate keys and super keys are also unique. When we talk about joining two relations or two tables together, in order to do that, we have to identify a foreign key. So a foreign key is an attribute that refers to an attribute in some other relation in order to establish that relationship between the two relations. Now, importantly, all values of our foreign key must be in the domain of values of the candidate key to which it refers. And normally it's best if our foreign key refers to uh, the primary key, but technically it just has to be any of the candidate keys that we've identified in our relation. So the foreign key is what establishes a relationship between two relations and allows us to do things like our inner join and our outer join. So the inner join is just uh, where we take our two relations and we create a new relation based on uh, a common value of the foreign key and the candidate key to which it refers, and we return all tuples that do have a matching tuple in the other relation, whereas the outer join returns not only all tuples that have a uh, matching tuple in the other relation, but also all non-matching tuples in one relation or the other or both, depending on if we do a left, right, or full outer join. So now going back to our ERD, uh, in order to create this in our database, we're going to have to generate some DDL or data definition language code. So in this case, to create our customer table, we're gonna say create table customer, and then we are listing our three attributes and some constraints around those. So our customer ID is gonna be of the data type integer, and we're identifying that as the primary key, which means it is going to be a unique identifier for the relation, and also it cannot have any null values. And then we're defining the other two attributes, fname and lname, to be of the data type variable character of a maximum length of 255. 
We have a similar situation over here for our product table. And then our line item table, which is the gerund that decompose that many to many uh, relationship is where we see the foreign key magic start to happen. So uh, we have again, create table and the name of the table line item. We have all of our attributes listed here. But when we list the customer ID attribute, we say it's of data type integer and it references this customer ID attribute in the customer table. Okay, so this is what is identifying customer ID as a foreign key that refers to this candidate key and in fact the primary key of the customer table to establish this relationship between a customer and a line item on a receipt. And then when we define the UPC attribute, we say it's of data type integer and it references the UPC attribute in the product table. So that defines this uh, relationship here and defines UPC as a foreign key. Then we have our other two attributes of quantity and purchase date. And then we say uh, the primary key of this line item uh, relation is going to be a composite key made up of customer ID, UPC, and purchase date. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over into Postgres and start executing this DDL code and then we'll run some queries to see how everything behaves. So here we are in SQL Workbench, which is the SQL client I've used to connect to our Postgres server. And uh, I have a, just a notepad file over here with the DDL code that's, uh, that was just in the presentation. So I'm just going to be copying and pasting uh, some of this code. Again, create table customer. Here are our three attributes, their data types, and then uh, the constraint that customer ID is our primary key. So I'm going to highlight that and click execute and we see uh, the result table customer created and then I am going to do the same thing for our product table and then for our line item table. And now note that we can't create the line item table until we have already created the product table and the customer table because the line item table references both the customer and the product table. So that's one of the referential integrity constraints that if this table is going to be referencing some other table, it has to be referencing a table that exists. So that's just part of how a relational database enforces constraints to keep our data consistent. So with that in place, I am also going to copy and paste uh, some statements here where I'm inserting some data. The basic format here is that we say insert into, then the name of the table, in this case, customer, our list of attributes, customer ID, F name, and L name, the word values, and then the value of customer ID, the value of F name, and the value of L name. And then in order to write this data permanently to the database, at the end of this, I'm going to commit. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight this, going to click the uh, execute button and you see we have 11 statements that were completed. At this point, I can say select asterisk from customer. And when I run this, I get a result showing all of the values for these attributes. Okay, so when we created the table, it created a schema for this customer relation and then the insert statement inserted data that fit that schema. We were to say select asterisks from product at this point, we get back just the schema, but no data because we haven't inserted any data yet. So let's remedy that. We'll go ahead and insert into our product some UPCs, descriptions, quantity on hand, and prices. Okay, so now we select asterisk from product. We see the products that we just uh, inserted here. And then finally, in order to represent customers purchasing some products, I'm going to insert into line item a customer ID, a UPC, the date which they're purchasing, and then the quantity of that product that they are purchasing. Okay, so I'm going to highlight this and click execute. Wait just a moment. Okay, and now we have uh, committed this data to our database. So we have 
customers. We have products. And we also have customers having purchased products, okay? So to kind of demonstrate the flexibility of our relational data model, let's uh, illustrate that we can run just a lot of different types of arbitrary queries. Um, so for example, we could say we wanna see all of our customers where the last name is Thompson. So when we execute this, we get these uh, two customers in response. We could all, or uh, in the result, we could also look for something like uh, where a last name starts with the letter J, right? So this is going to show us all of our customers with the last name of Johnson and Jones. And there's a lot more uh, complex ways that we can do this type of matching. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in the next video. We could also do aggregate functions. So if we were interested in something like how many customers do we have that share each last name, we could say select uh, L name and then not sum, but the count of tuples from customer. And we're going to group by L name. And when we do this, we see that we have two customers with the last name of Thompson, one Johnson, two Jones, three Smith. We could uh, make this maybe a little more uh, easy to read. Let's say an order by count, and we'll do it in descending order. And now it's from our most frequently observed last name to our least frequently observed last name. And I'm not going into a lot of depth about the structure of these SQL queries because that's what should be covered in your relational database class. So I'm just kind of giving a little bit of a refresher here about how all of this works. So now if we wanted to start bringing together data from uh, multiple relations, we can do that using joins. Okay, so we're gonna select all of our attributes from our customer relation, and we're going to join that to the gerund, this line item relation, where the customer ID in the customer relation is equal to the customer ID in the line item relation. And then we are further going to join that resulting relation to our product relation based on the UPC in the line item relation being equal to the UPC in the product relation. And then to make it a little bit easier to read, we're gonna order this uh, by purchase date. So we're gonna get all of our transactions on one particular date together. And then within the date, order by customer ID. So when we execute this, we now see that uh, Adam Johnson on 8.15 purchased these uh, six items, right? And purchased two uh, bags of apples, one chicken, one bag of Doritos, two bottles of water, one bottle of milk, one gallon of milk, and two packages of eggs, right? That Thompson purchased this stuff and so forth and so on. And we can, uh, we can query all kinds of different ways. So, Let's say for a moment, and all of these queries are in the provided course materials, so you can copy and paste and modify and try these out on your own. If we wanted to return our data in a little bit different way, and let's say we wanna pretty things up a little bit, instead of separately having first name and last name, we want to concatenate those together and just call it customer name. So we're gonna return our customer name, the date of the purchase, the description of what was purchased, the quantity, the price, and then we're going to create a derived attribute, which is the extended price, right? So in this case, when Adam Johnson purchased uh, two apples at $1.99 each, what would be uh, really nice to know is, well, what was the total amount that he paid for these apples? So two times $1.99, $3.98 would be pretty useful to see. So we can derive that attribute by saying quantity times price as total, okay? And then again, we're just joining this to the line item and the product, and then uh, we're only looking at this one transaction where we have customer ID 101 on this particular date. So now when we execute this, we see, and this is starting to look a lot like what 
uh, Adam Johnson's receipt would look like, right? We have an apple, uh, we have a quantity of two, they're $1.99 each, and it's $3.98 for the two of them. Uh, one chicken at $3.49, the total price is $3.49, but two bottles of water at 99 cents together is $1.98. Okay, so we have a lot of flexibility with how we query our database, right? We could also uh, look at something like the total amount of, uh, or the total value of the product sold across all customers for a particular date. And that's what this query is going to do, is show us the date, the sum of all of our quantities times the price of the item that was sold, grouped by the purchase date. Okay, so when we do this, we can see that uh, independent of the customers, on, or across all customers, on 8.15, we sold $18.59 worth of goods. On 8.16, it was $51.17, and so on down the line. Or we could do something else if we were interested in seeing uh, the total amount that each customer has spent. Right? We could do something like this and say over all the purchases, over all the days uh, in their history, this is how much each customer has spent at our grocery store. So that's one of the great things about relational databases is we have query pliancy. Any question that we want to answer about this data, we can write a SQL query to answer that. Right? And we've because we've defined what the schema of the data and what the relational constraints are up front. Okay? And this is a little bit different than what we're going to see in the future when we start looking at non-relational databases. So as discussed, relational databases are very strict about defining what your data is going to look like ahead of time, and that's the schema. Now, the benefit you get from this is that the relational database is very flexible with answering questions you weren't initially planning on at the beginning, which is the idea of query pliability. And this is often not the case with non-relational da databases, which either have a weak or no schema at all, which the benefit is that allows you to describe what your data looks like on the fly as you're entering it, but that's going to reduce how flexible you're going to be with the questions you ask. Now, of course, with structured query language, we can also modify data once it has been created. We do this with our data modification language portion of SQL. So, uh, for example, in order to update the price of apples, we could say update product, set price equal whatever the new price is, where the UPC is 1234, which is the uh, UPC code for apples. However, as I, as I think about this, this kind of raises the question, so now for all the people that purchased apples in the past where we just recorded their customer ID and the UPC and the date of the purchase, we're gonna think they paid 249 for apples. So maybe our initial design was incorrect and we actually should have been recording the price that the customer paid at the time they paid it. Right? And so this is kind of the iterative process of database design and why these ERDs are so helpful to be able to describe to your business users what the implications of making a change like this would be. And so hopefully you catch this before it causes problems and you can, you can fix it before it goes into production and you know, live and learn, always be striving to get better. Now, let's say we tried our Apple update and decided that was a bad idea and we just wanted to delete apples from the database altogether. We could say something like delete from product where UPC equals the UPC for apples. And what's going to happen is our relational database is going to continue to enforce consistency. It is not going to allow you to delete that product as long as the line item relation has an instance that is referring to that product. Okay, that's just maintaining referential integrity within the database. And that's one of the core tenets of our uh, relational model. And uh, if we wanted to not just delete a single item, but if we wanted to delete all of our data altogether, we can use the drop table command. Uh, we would have to do it in this order, drop table line item, followed by drop item, or drop table customer, then drop table product because line item refers to customer and product. So again, our relational database is going to enforce the integrity constraint 
uh, and not let you delete or drop the table customer or product as long as the line item table exists and is referring to them. Now, as we've gone through all of our SQL queries, there are only four things that we have been able to do, and it's an unfortunate abbreviation we use to describe this, CRUD. We can create, read, update, and delete data, right? So in our create table and insert statements, that was create, uh, select attributes from the table, that's reading. Our update query was for updating data, and then drop and delete, delete data, right? So these are the four things that we can do to our data. And now the final topic that we need to cover in this video is around transactions and ACID compliance. So one thing we need to understand is that relational databases are transactional in nature, and a transaction may actually be made up of multiple individual operations. And those operations need to be all or nothing, right? If one operation in a transaction happens, we need all the uh, operations in the transaction to complete. And that's the idea of being atomic. A transaction is either completely successful or completely fails. There is nothing in between because if only part of a transaction successfully completes, it has the opportunity to leave our database in an inconsistent state, which is the C of ACID, our transactions must be consistent and leave the database in a valid state, right? We can't have a situation where uh, we have a tuple that refers to some other tuple that no longer exists because only half of a transaction was able to uh, be completed. Okay. Our transactions should also be isolated in that if we have multiple people or multiple applications querying the database at the same time, one person's query cannot interfere with another person's query. They are isolated from one another. And once a transaction has been committed to the database, it has to exist forever, right? It's going to be written to the disk and it is going to be durable, right? And even if the database crashes or is shut down or, uh, or whatever happens, that transaction is going to remain written to disk. And so our non-relational databases often make trade-offs on uh, the, the atomic nature, consistency, isolation, and durability of, of transactions in order to gain some other benefits which we'll be discussing for the duration of the course. So in order to ensure that everything we do with our database uh, adheres to ACID compliance, we need to form transactions. So one popular example of a transaction in a database would be when you transfer money from one account to another account at your bank, right? And there's actually two things that happen when you do this. One, you deduct the money from account A, and then two, you credit the money to account B. And it's important that if either one of these happens, both of them happen, right? Because as a customer, you would lose money if the money was deducted from account A and then the database crashed before it was credited to account B. Or the bank would lose money if it was credited to account B but not deducted from account A. So it's important that this transaction be all or nothing, okay? And similarly, in our grocery store example, we want the two operations that have to take place to insert into our line item table and to update the quantity on hand in our product table, we want both of those to happen if either one is going to happen. So to ensure that both of them happen, we're going to wrap it in a transaction. Okay, so we're gonna move uh, back over to Postgres for just a minute and take a look at how that works. So in order to illustrate this idea of transactions and ACID compliance, let's work through an example in our database. So at this point where we left off, we have quite a few uh, sales that we've recorded in our line items relation. And just for the sake of making it a little bit easier to see what's going on, I'm actually going to delete everything from our, uh, from our line item relation. So I'm gonna say delete from line item. When I do this, it says 30 rows affected. And sure enough, now if we select from line item, we get nothing, okay? And we just did this to make it a little bit easier to see what we're going to be doing here. 
So as discussed, when someone purchases a product, we have two things we want to do. We want to insert into the line item uh, table, and then we want to update the product table to deduct the number of items they purchased from the quantity on hand. But what if something awful happened and the database crashed or something like that after this insert occurred, but before the update occurred? So now we have uh, the purchase in our line item relation. However, we haven't updated the quantity on hand in the product table. Okay, so this is an inconsistent state and this is not the state that we want to be in. So what we actually want to do is create a transaction. And the transaction is either going to uh, be completed in full, or if the transaction fails, everything that, that happened is going to be rolled back. Okay, so in order to do that, I'm actually going to delete from this line item relation again. And so we see we currently have nothing in our line item. We currently have 20 apples. We're going to begin our transaction. We are going to insert into the line item table. We're going to update our product table. And then if we don't end the transaction and something happens, then this entire transaction would be rolled back like it never happened. So once we end the transaction, we look and we see we have that in the line item table. We have a quantity of 18 apples. And then even if something awful happens, those transactions are still recorded. The transaction is durable. So that's it for our brief overview of relational databases. We'll see you next time.